Hi everyone, welcome back to the Dr. Sia channel. In the video here today, we're gonna to be talking about self-punishment and disorganized attachment styles. If you haven't checked out my other two videos on avoidant attachment style and ambivalent attachment style and self-punishment and what goes on there, I'll link them up there for you. But in this video, we're gonna be looking at disorganized attachment style, which is, um, many would say, the nastiest of them, the most hurtful of them, the one that is meant to hurt the person the most. So of course, because we're doing that and we're looking at self-punishment, just a little bit of a warning, we're about to talk about some really, really, really nasty and hurtful things that happen within people so if you're feeling particularly sensitive about that please just you know watch one of my other videos not necessarily this one all right let's get started All right, so what is self-punishment about in disorganized attachment styles? To understand that, we first have to understand how a person comes about to develop a disorganized attachment style. Now, for children who developed disorganized attachment styles, there was no safety. They could not have any safety in any way. So basically what happens for them is whether they were close to their parent, they were potentially in danger, whether they were far away from their parent, they were potentially in danger. So these children, and this is just a very brief version of it, I have a lot more about attachment styles on, my, on this very um, uh, playlist on ISTDP and attachment styles. So check it, check it out if you want to know a lot more about disorganized attachment styles. But for these children, basically, the same source of danger was the same source of safety. So for example, their parents were extremely chaotic and extremely unpredictable. Daddy comes home one day and he beats me to a pulp. And then the next day, daddy comes home and he's really caring. What's going on? So th there was really no way to know whether a person is safe or not. And that's the way that their world moves on and moves into adulthood, unless something is done about it, of course, before. So for these people, self-punishment comes up as a given, as a must, as a given outcome of anything that happens inside. These people, people with a disorganized attachment style, they simply expect the abuse to happen. They expect the punishment to happen. And if the punishment does not happen, some part of them brings on the punishment from within. So remember, they're not from the child from childhood, they learn they cannot be safe, they cannot just be punished, they must struggle with this concept constantly, they must constantly be at threat. So for a person with a disorganized attachment style, often when they do anything that strongly shows that they were um, safe, any strong expression of safety often is followed by self-punishment. I'll give you an example because this is quite complicated to understand. So, for example, a person with disorganized attachment style might be very trusting towards another person. And this trust that they display might be, if we look at it objectively, valid. You know, they trusted a person who seemed trustworthy and it was all good. Now, this other person might turn out to be a fraud or might turn out to have deceived them somehow or might turn out to have been uh, nasty towards them somehow. Of course, for anyone who doesn't have a disorganized attachment style, we'd be looking at what's going on with that person, how dare they, how can they be so hurtful, how dare they do that to us, and so on and so forth, and we try to sort of understand the situation. Now, for a person with a disorganized attachment style, they do something called splitting. And sometimes they split into extreme rage and anger towards the person who hurt them and betrayed their trust. And sometimes they split into extreme self-punishment, self-blame about putting their trust in somebody else. Now this extreme form of self-punishment of course becomes things that are really horrific. So just the warning here, the kind of things that we're talking about, if you do have a sensitivity to these kind of things, just turn off the video now, go watch something else. But if you don't, let's keep moving on, all right? So what they then might find themselves doing is things like cutting themselves. They might find themselves contracting intentionally a disease. So this is what some of my patients have said, that they have intentionally attempted or successfully contracted a disease, sometimes a lethal disease, sometimes a non-lethal disease, to punish themselves for that trust that they put in somebody else and how it was sort of abused, how it was taken advantage of, but they believe it's their own fault, so they need to be severely punished. They have done things like 
for example, stayed in prostitution for 10 years, even though they disliked the work, or sorry, it's called sex work these days, sex work, and even though they disliked the work, even though they suffer from the work, but felt that they need to stay in that job to suffer. I'm not saying everybody who does sex work is doing it to suffer. They don't, but they have done it to suffer, these, these people with the self-punishment. So they might have done other things like, for example, used extremely severe drugs that really does damage to their brains, to their minds, to their bodies, to their ability to function. Again, as another way of that punishment, they might end extremely successful and useful relationships or at least relationships that have the prospect of being that way, again, to punish themselves. So you can hear how there's some really nasty things going on. And these are just some of the things that, they, that, that the self-punishment does to a person who has a disorganized attachment style. So what do we then do for them in therapy? Well, what we help them see is that first of all, that whatever happened to them in their childhood, that they were, in a sense, the outcome of that, that some part of them is the outcome of that, that they are not responsible for it. It's called being a victim, but they don't like being called a victim. Nobody, well, a lot of people don't like being called a victim, but it actually is victimizing. It's abuse and it is victimizing. But they're not the, the people who created it. A child didn't create the abuse. So we start getting a sense of compassion going. We start getting a sense of an understanding going that where they are today and this punishment is actually a repetitive nature of that same trauma that they experienced in their childhoods. And that the punishment just wants to punish them for anything that might be healthy, for any act, thought, or feeling that might be healthy, but turns out not okay for whatever reason. So as they start turning against this immense self-punishment, then we can slowly start looking at and gently start looking at the feelings that they have underneath about the, uh, the things that happened to them, about the experiences that they've had in their life, about this extremely disorganized pattern in their childhood and the unreliable caretaking that they received, for example. But to do that, one of the first things we have to focus on with disorganized uh, attachment styles is to help them move beyond this extreme, severe sense of self-punishment within themselves. Until we do that, we can't really do much else. And until we do that, we'll find that no matter what we do in therapy, it's actually not going to be useful. And in fact, it might just be more harmful because like we said before, if we try to do something good and the self-punishment sits there behind that, sooner or later the self-punishment is going to take over and punish the person even for trying to do something good. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something about it. If you are an ISTDP therapist, let me know what you do think about these videos. If you would like for me to create a series more specifically for ISTDP therapists where we can talk more, use more of the language and more of the jargon uh, to get a little bit more deep into some of these issues, I'm happy to do that. If you're a student of ISTDP, let me know what you think. If you're a student of something else, of CBT, of social work, or whatever else that you might be doing, also let me know if there's anything that I can create for you, any content that you might find more useful and more tailored to the kind of things that you are doing. I really appreciate you watching. Please subscribe, please comment, please press the bell button, and I'll see you again for the next one.